All right, so today we're going to talk about some uh, non-traditional automation. Uh, just a little bit about me. My name is Paul Grizzaffi. I'm a principal automation architect at Magenic. Uh, we do consulting. Uh, we do full typical consulting, but we'll also do QA and QE only. Uh, we'll do automation only consultation as well. I spent my career focused on, on automation and automation related activities, and I'm a self-proclaimed metalhead. If you want to contact me outside of this forum, here is my contact info, and the link at the bottom is, uh, is my blog, and this will come back up on the question slide at the end. So in the interest of time, we'll jump right in. So when I say automation, what comes to mind? So typically, we talk about scripts. I have a script. I wrote a script to do something for me. And where did those scripts come from? Where did I get what needs to go in those scripts? Well, they probably came from some test cases. We had some test cases that the testers use. So we're going to take those and we're going to turn them into scripts. So how are we going to do that? Well, we need a tool or one or more tools, right? So now we have a tool that can take our test scripts, our test cases, and turn them into test scripts so that we can do regression testing because everyone knows that automation is best suited for regression testing because we spend so much time and so much effort doing this regression tests over and over and over. It's, it's repetitive. It's, it's a great candidate for automation, right? Cool. Now that I've got all my regression testing automated, it's going to save me time. But now that I'm saving time, what are you going to do with me? Right? Well, what's going to happen to me if we don't need me to be running the regression anymore. That's okay. Don't worry about it. It's a lot of work to get this done. It's going to take forever. You're going to have a job for a long time. And you know, this last company I worked at, the automation was so brittle. Every time we made a new release, we had to rewrite half the automation or re-record it. And it, it, it just, it wasn't panning out very well. And it was inconsistent too. You know, that test case 27, it never really ran the right way. And then Oh, uh, test case 49. Well, that one runs and passes most of the time. Once in a while it fails, but then we run it again and it passes. So we're, we're, we're pretty good with that. Has anyone said or heard any of these things? Yeah, right here. Um, yes, a lot of the conversations that I have and still have with people about, uh, about their automation initiatives and their experience and, and what they're expecting and seeing revolves a lot around this. This, this notion of traditional automation. But as our friend Inigo Montoya is paraphrased to say, uh, when we talk about automation, I do not think it means what you think it means, uh, what the industry thinks it means, and what a lot of our discipline thinks it means. But before we jump into that, we'll talk a little bit about traditions. Uh, traditions can be important. They can be valuable, uh, much like Thanksgiving here in the United States. Um, Traditions can play an important role in what we do. When we talk about traditional automation, that automation which is based around taking a test case and turning it into a test script using one or more tools, uh, there can be value there. Uh, it can detect behavior changes. Uh, it can reduce effort on smoke and, and regression testing, even though I, I poked a little fun at that earlier. Uh, we certainly can have earlier execution because if it's automated, we can kick it off while we're doing other things. We can get earlier alerts that way, and we can have scheduled execution either on some sort of time boundary or on an event boundary like every time there's a check-in or every time there's a deploy. Um, every company, every team, and every client that I, I've been with, uh, I've done this with them, and it can be valuable. It's produced some level of value. But is there something else? Is there something else we can be doing in addition to traditional automation? And what I would say is, what if we think differently? What if we stop thinking about test cases and, uh, and such and start thinking about this from a different angle? What the guy here is wearing is something called the Fortis Exoskeleton, uh, developed by Lockheed Martin. And the idea is you put this contraption on and it allows you to hold awkward, heavy, um, hard to manage equipment for extended periods of time. Now. These are the people at Lockheed Martin, right? A bunch of geniuses. So I guess they could have invented a, a grinding robot, right? Because what that guy's holding there is a, is a grinder. 
and I don't know much about the, the grinding business, but I would assume that it's a pretty heavy and unwieldy piece of equipment to use. There's probably a lot of fatigue, especially your arms and your back. Um, they could have invented a grinding robot, I guess, but for some reason they didn't. They didn't invent this robot. They invented um, something to help the human do the job better. So if we stop thinking about automation for a few minutes and think about, let's help the humans do their job. And the humans we're talking about here typically are testers, people who are trying to test the software, the platform, the, the, the system that we, we, we have that we're attempting to either sell or, or let users use or have clients or whatever. If we start thinking about, hey, what would make us more efficient or more effective at our job? And again, stepping away from, I've got these test cases I have to run. What makes us more efficient or more effective at our jobs? And what's valuable? What are we doing that is valuable? And what can we do to apply technology to help us achieve greater value? And the value needs to be mapped directly into our business goals. Otherwise, we we run the risk of running afoul of those business goals and actually costing ourselves money and reducing value. And what hurts? Everything, everybody's got some aspect of their job that just sucks. Uh, wouldn't it be great if there was something, you know, we could spray a little medicine on that pain point, spray a little automation to take some of the pain away to allow us to, allow us to be <laughs> more more pleasant at our jobs, uh, to enjoy our jobs more, to be more effective because psychologically we're in a better spot because we don't have to do this direct work anymore that computers are really good at doing. So instead of talking about automation and automating, how about assistance and assisting? So we come to this term called automation assist. And it's a term that uh, a, a former boss of mine uh, coined, and I took and expanded the definition of it. But basically, we wound up using it as an umbrella term for non-traditional automation. A different guy I used to work with and for named Patrick Amaku used to tell me, Paul, words mean things. And I know that's not an original quote from him, but the way he delivered it has always stuck with me because it's just three little words in that sentence, words mean things, and in his deep baritone uh Nigerian accent, it really stuck with me there as well. And, and changing the meaning of words and concepts is difficult. To go out and, and battle against, no, no, automation is more than test, case, test cases and test scripts. Certainly can be done, and certainly maybe we flank, you know, we, we attack the flank and work that way. But a head on charge for that is going to be difficult because the concepts of, quote, test automation and taking test cases and turning into test scripts is so ingrained in, in our field and so ingrained in technology as a whole, it's going to be very difficult to get people to understand that. So inventing some new vocabulary for these additional concepts, even though under the bigger concept, it's all sort of the same, but being able to distinguish, you no, know, now we're talking about something else that's going to help you be more valuable and help bring more value to the table. It, it gives them something to sort of hang their hats on when we have the conversation, some sort of frame of reference. And really what we're looking for here are things that increase the value of the manual effort that we're putting in, of the effort that the testers are putting in to try and deliver information about how the system is and is not working. And I, I tend to put these in the three different types of buckets. Um, Off-label tool use, which um, if you're familiar with, the, with pharmaceuticals, off-label means to use a drug or a medication in a way that it wasn't really intended for, but it is still approved for uh, because of some side effect that is beneficial. Uh, we do the same thing with our automation tools, our automation tools that are traditionally thought of or traditionally intended to be used for test cases and test scripts can be used to do other types of automation. And sometimes what we need just doesn't exist or doesn't exist yet. So we may have to create some new tools or some new applications or some new scripts. And then the third bucket we're not going to discuss today because pretty much everyone uh, attending this conference is, is familiar with programming and, and command line tools. But tools not traditionally used in automation. Uh, when I talk to a, a less automation specific audience, I, I take people through being able to use the command line tools like uh, 
grep and type and tail and all those types of things to be able to do file processing and help us get additional information out of the systems we're testing and out of the tools that we're using to figure out wh wh where potential problems are, trends are, deltas are. So let's look at a few examples, shall we? So the first example is called MERV, uh, and MERV is a, a military term for, effectively, it's for a missile that goes up and, and shoots down individual missiles at individually targeted sites. And we'll talk about where the analogy is on that here shortly. But the premise here is we're doing a data center move for a very large, uh, very complex product, uh, presumably our largest and most complex product. And the, the, the migration was really more of an evacuation because we weren't taking anything uh, except those things that could not be kicked. So if you can kick it, it was staying. So all the hardware was staying, the cables, the wiring, the frames, everything was staying. And the new data center, we have new equipment. So we have new server topology, new network topology, new operating system versions in some case, new database versions in some case, some cases. So imagine taking your, your application that you have a fairly good idea about how it works and where the, the blemishes are and where, the, where it needs to be propped up and where it works really well and plopping this thing into this new alien world. How do you test this? Well, we had some experience from the previous year. We'd done the first migration. The first migration was from ostensibly our second most complex and second largest application. And saving you some of, some of the, the, the details there, what was determined was running smoke tests and regression tests were not that valuable because it didn't give the feed, they didn't give the feedback that uh, we really were looking for in the amount of time we were looking for it. And our experience was it wasn't going to be that the calculations weren't working. It wasn't going to be that there was an error in the algorithm because we're taking the same code and bringing it over to this new environment. The system was basically going to work or it was going to be egregiously broken. Now, when we say egregiously broken, what are we talking about? Well, it's either going to return the proper data or it's going to not return anything at all and we're going to get some empty grid or uh, a 404 or a 500 or a server crash or something along those lines. So knowing this, knowing this piece of contextual information allowed us to come up with a valuable solution that was appropriate for the problem we were trying to fix. So what we did was we came up with scripts based on the existing tool we had in-house at the time, looking for these egregious issues. And we executed them simultaneously, targeting very specific clients to do very specific things. Um, what was, how do we target these, or how do we look to find these egregious errors? Well, what we were looking for were things that weren't connected together. So if we knew that our data flow or our program flow from page one to page seven to page six to page nine would tell us, oh, well, these seven services are now up and not only up and communicating, but they're actually communicating to the UI, to the front end, everything is plumbed correctly. Because hitting the individual services would have been fine to make sure that they're responding. But again, we had a high level of confidence that that was going to happen. What we didn't have a high level of confidence in was that everything was going to make it through the, uh, the network highway, if you will. We had to run them simultaneously because we were doing multiple, um, multiple healthcare clients per night. And uh, somewhere in, in the range of two to 600, or maybe two to 800. It's been a while since this happened uh, per night. So we couldn't just say, well, let's run them all sequentially. We had to be able to target them specifically, running them in, par uh, running them in parallel. And what this did was it allowed the testers to focus on the higher risk clients, those that spent more money with us, those that had a history of issues with us, those whose data was particularly... Um, uh, difficult to manage and difficult to deal with so that they could do a lot more looking and narrow and, and, and lateral thinking around, okay, is the system for these clients, these potentially troublesome clients behaving the correct way and the lower risk clients 
the automation would, would run. And if it didn't report any issues back, we just kind of said, okay, everything's looking good enough there. And if it did report an issue back, then the testers would go and have a look at it. But this did take us several weeks of effort to do. Uh, the tool we had in-house at the time was called Test Complete. And we just repurposed it, not so much for test scripts, but more for web driving through the actual website. So why don't we go with this approach? Uh, the quick shallow checks can maximize the human's value. Like I said before, we focus the humans on the problematic areas or the risky areas and looking at any problems that were that were identified. Uh, reusing the existing tool reduces effort because nobody had to learn new things. We could take some people that were already working on other activities and put them working on this particular activity. And it allowed us to find somewhere between 12 and, and 7 and 12 business critical incidents and there's that weird range there of seven to 12, because depending on who you talk to, it would be a different number because they were they were counting them differently. Uh, but the idea is that any business critical incident was a major outage or a major uh, portion of the product had an outage. And we were at risk to not only lose a client, but to pay back some money a client had already paid to us. So preventing actual material loss, if you will. At the same time, we were taking a page out of the high volume automated testing book. Now, high volume automated testing, if you're not familiar with it, is not uh, load performance capacity testing. It's a family of testing techniques that allows the tester to create, to run, and to evaluate the results of arbitrarily many tests. This particular definition and a lot of the concepts came out of the workshop on teaching software testing back in 2013. You'll also find it in the, in the literature, such that there is, because there's not a whole lot of information out there on it. Um, it's called HiVat. And a lot of it will derive from, or at least springboard out of this particular URL uh, by Dr. Uh, Kim Kaner. And Harry Robinson's done a lot of interesting work here as well, especially with respect to testing Google Maps. So if you can find his information uh, springboarding off of that, there's a really interesting read there. I got to see him at STPCon a few years ago, uh, and uh, the presentation was really good. So there are a lot of different facets and different um, uh, notions around high volume automated testing. But for the organization I was working with here, the, the, the main facets we were interested in was the mini executions, the random execution, and that the results are vetted by humans so that there's no pass fail coming out of what we're going to talk about here. It's a, we found nothing that violated your heuristic, or we found some number of things that did. You probably should go and take a look at those first. So from this, we created something called SCUD. And SCUD is another play on a military reference. If you're not familiar with the SCUD missile, it came to sort of public prominence in the 80s uh, due to its notoriously poor guidance system where sometimes it would just shoot off in a random direction. Uh, the guy I used to work for was really into weaponry and, and military weapons and such. So a lot of our, a lot of our, our snarky names and references uh, became uh, armament based. But again, the premise, the same product as before, um, large, complex aging. It was not created with testability in mind. And it certainly was not created with automatability in mind. So there were certain things that were difficult to automate just in general. But also, it wasn't really feasible to enumerate and follow all of the code paths. Why not? Why can't we just list those out? Why can't we get a machine to help us list those out? Uh, the, the issue was that the product was so configurable that when you say, hey, we have this product and we have 800 client sites, the level of configurability made it really more like 600 different products just because not only could you have menu items appear or not appear, they could appear in different orders for different clients. Uh, so it, it was very difficult to actually say, let's go and quote, test everything. But again, remember, we didn't really need to test everything because we knew that in general, that this was going to basically work you know, when, we did, when we did the data center migration. It was basically going to give us the right answers back based on certain workflows, or it was going to be egregiously broken. It was just going to flop, right? 
So again, knowing we couldn't enumerate everything, we couldn't cover everything in the amount of time that we had to do these, these, these migrations, we had to come up with some other approach. So we came up with something called the random menu clicker, which we nicknamed SCUD due to its randomness. And the idea was that it would randomly click menu items looking for things that didn't seem right. So the notion here is that we are testing without an oracle. We don't know what the right answer should be. Given any particular menu item, if we click it, where should it take us? What should the screen look like? We didn't encode that in because we kind of didn't care. We only cared if something, quote, bad happened, something didn't seem right. What might not seem right? The word error on a page or a 404 or a 500 or any of these other types of activities, right? The, the, the notion here is that the random link clicker would go through and randomly, or the random menu clicker would go through and randomly click these items, exploring paths that were valid, software let me do it, but not necessarily intuitive. So it was able to go and find issues, concerns, heuristic failures um, that the other, that the MERV didn't find because that was very programmatic. That was very, a lot of forethought into it. We need to go and validate and check that these things are up and running. This was a, hey, just go through the system and click on things and try to find things. Doing it randomly meant that we would get these unintuitive paths. Also knowing that we couldn't do them all, which ones do we pick? Well, we already picked the high volume or the high value ones, the high risk ones by creating MERV. Now we're going with the any of the other ones, the ones using SCUD. And we found four issues in just the first week of use, any of which could have turned into a business critical incident had we found it later or not found it at all by the time we did the push out. Now here we did a technology change. Uh, we used Selenium and we wrote it in Python and it took about three days of effort to write this thing. So why this solution? Well, value was shown in a previous organization, a previous company I worked at, we, we had a random link clicker um, because we were able to go through and randomly click just any any URL, any A tag, and look for the same sorts of, uh, of weirdnesses, of, of heuristic failures along the way. Uh, Selenium was the right kind of toolkit here. Um, trying it with other tools, the other tools wanted to be the boss. They wanted you to do things their way, but we had to go and color outside of the lines because this was less of a test script-based activity and more of a DOM poking activity. We wanted to poke the DOM, find out where things are. Um, and broad license usage. So we weren't competing with test completes license usage. We didn't have to make a decision. Hey, do we, do we run SCUD? Do we run MERV? We could run both this way. And our last example for the day is the zero remover. In general, I would ask if we're doing this in person, I would say, how many people think it's a good idea to automate something you're only going to use once? Um, and generally, everybody says, no, not me, or, or maybe. And the answer really is maybe. So the premise here is we had a tool that would uh, compare thousands of golden file, files to thousands of results run from the tool. But in some cases, there was a code change made. In some cases, a database now returns null instead of zero dollars and zero cents. Uh, and to go through and figure out which cases were supposed to be which way, make the changes and retest everything, uh, the manual effort estimate came back at four to six weeks. So when the, the QA architect and the, the, the QA manager came over and said, hey, um, we think four to six weeks, and I picked myself up off the floor. I said, well, let's, let's, pretend, let's pretend it's just two weeks of effort. Um, what can we do about this? So we sketched some things out on the board, and the algorithm was very easy to program, but it was very difficult to, or it was tedious and error prone to execute by a human. So we just wrote a script to program to do it. Wrote it in C sharp, took me about a half a day, and we ran it once. Okay, fine, I tested it a couple of times, but it really only ran once to make those modifications. So why do we go with this solution? It was disposable. Didn't really matter what language we wrote it in. The code was horrific, but it worked. And we're a Windows and .NET shop, so it made sense that those were the tools we had at our disposal, easy to use. And it was an easy to distribute executable, because at the time of the creation of this, 
we didn't know our offshore is our offshore team going to run this is our architect going to run this am i supposed to run this who's going to do the execution and do the validation so i could plop it out on a file share and say hey it's out there do what you will with it so on all of these i talked a little about effort and effort calculation is a funny thing uh, we like to talk about roi in in test automation and you know when when when, is, when am i going to get my roi and it can be very difficult to calculate because um, once you have a new tool, you can not only use the tool for which you thought you were going to use it for, but you can gain all sorts of other benefits too. So that return on investment calculation gets very, uh, very messy very quickly. Uh, and in fact, if you listen to Don Haynes, and I do, uh, I suggest this blog very, very highly. I recommend this every chance I get. Uh, there ain't no ROI in, in software testing uh, and therefore in automation as well. And that's not to say there's not value. It's to say that ROI is the wrong thing to look at. If we really want to do that sort of analysis, what we're talking about is a cost-benefit analysis, not a, uh, a not a um, an ROI calculation. Opportunity cost, which is the cost of, of performing activity A instead of activity B, can be a lot easier to calculate and just as useful because if we're talking to money people, Money people understand opportunity cost. But the core, think about value. So quickly, some takeaways before we can jump over to some questions is this is different. So if you take this and you go to a job interview and say, yep, I know all about this non-traditional automation stuff. Here's some things we should do. Uh, the hiring manager is just as likely to say, that's cute. Do you know Selenium? That's cute. Do you know tool A, tool B, you know, Cypress, WebIO, whatever. Uh, scripting test is okay. There's nothing wrong with that, uh, but it is an implementation of automation. It's not automation itself. So let's not confuse the implementation with the actual thing. And this is situational. Uh, the knowns help guide us, right? So we knew that running regression and, and uh, smoke uh, regression tests and smoke tests on uh, that data center migration wasn't going to provide us the value we needed. So knowing that helped us craft an appropriate solution. And keep in mind the ecosystem, who's going to run it, how do we distribute it, the C-sharp um, zero remover that I created, and the lifespan. Are we going to throw it away? Is it disposable? Then maybe you want to um, do a quick and dirty. Maybe you even might want to use record and playback, but that's a subject for another show. <laughs>